Welcome to the Connecticut Case Law Podcast. Each week we examine the latest appeals decided by the Connecticut Supreme Court and the Connecticut Appellate Court. We focus on three areas of law, criminal law, personal injury law, and family law, each sponsored by a firm that concentrates in that type of law. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast and get the newest episode each week and stay up to date on the latest case law. You can also visit our website, ConnecticutCaseLawPodcast.com, and register to get an alert every time a new episode is released. And now, let's get into the latest decisions after a quick word from our first sponsor. If you know someone who needs the advice of a criminal defense or civil rights attorney, the lawyers at Ruan Attorneys should be the first firm you turn to. Our lawyers handle criminal cases in every courthouse in the state, from juvenile cases through arguing and winning in the Connecticut Supreme Court, and they welcome your referrals. Our trial team is led by attorney Jim Ruane, one of the few board-certified criminal trial specialists in the state. And Ruane Attorneys has the experience and relationships to handle any type of criminal case you throw at them. Our civil rights team is led by attorney Dan Lage, twice selected as an award-winning lawyer by the Connecticut Law Tribune. What's more, Ruane Attorneys is always available to consult with fellow attorneys on criminal law issues at any time. Put the power of over 500 five-star reviews to work for your criminal case referrals by trusting Ruane Attorneys with your referral. Visit RuaneAttorneys.com for more information or email our team at referral at RuaneAttorneys.com. Next up, criminal law cases. Hi, and welcome to the Connecticut Case Law Podcast. I'm Dan Lage, civil rights and criminal defense lawyer from Ruane Attorneys at Law in Shelton, Connecticut. And every week I'll be bringing you the latest developments from the Appellate and Supreme Court in Connecticut in the area of criminal law. This episode is special in that we'll stick with the Supreme Court and we'll cover the entire month of September. There are four cases, and in those four cases we'll learn a little bit about what constitutes a criminal trespass, how many times one can violate a protective order during a conversation, we'll review the Golding Review, and discuss a sufficiency of the evidence claim Coming up next here on the Connecticut Case Law Podcast, where we read the cases so you don't have to. Our first case is State of Connecticut versus Cody M. The citation is SC20213. It's a decision written by Chief Justice Robinson and released on September 21st, 2020. Here are your facts. The defendant was the subject of a standing criminal protective order. One of the conditions of that protective order was that the defendant not contact the protected party. The protected party was a woman who shared a child with the defendant, and at an unrelated hearing in juvenile court, the defendant and the protected party were placed in the courtroom together. At some point, the defendant attempted to engage in conversation with the protected party, who ignored him, made no eye contact. Later on, the defendant's behavior escalated, at which point he began shouting threats, such as, I'm going to kill her, She better watch herself or something to that effect. She's going to have problems when she gets home. This behavior prompted the state to charge the defendant with, among other things, two counts of violating the standing criminal protective order. The defendant was convicted on both counts after a jury trial, appealed that conviction. The conviction was affirmed by the appellate court, bringing the defendant to the Supreme Court to answer two questions. Does the statute governing violations of a standing criminal protective order permit convictions for multiple distinct acts? And second, were the defendant's statements in this case a single act or were they multiple acts under the statute? The first question is essentially a double jeopardy claim. And the Supreme Court pointed to State versus Garvin and said the proper double jeopardy inquiry when a defendant is convicted of multiple violations of the same statutory provision is whether the legislature intended to punish the individual acts separately or to punish only the course of action which they constitute. The defendant argued that because 53A.223A contains the word involves in subsection C, that clearly indicates that the legislature intended that the unit of prosecution in this case, to be on a transactional basis. If there was any statutory ambiguity, the defendant requested that the court apply the rule of lenity to resolve it. The state, of course, had a different point of view and argued that 53A.223A is unambiguous and the statute clearly permits multiple convictions for separate acts, 
because the text does not expressly state that a violation is a continuing act. It supported that argument by contrasting 223A with a related statute, 53A-222, which governs violations of conditions of release and includes the language that specifically indicates that a violation is a continuing offense. The Supreme Court looked at the plain language of the statute at issue, 53A-223A, and held that it does not define when a violation begins and ends. Therefore, the statute can reasonably be read to prohibit either a course of conduct or discrete acts, each of which may be sufficient to constitute a violation. As a result, the court needs to look outside the statutory text, and in this case, it adopted the point of view of the state and construed 53A-223A in light of similar surrounding statutes. And so when you look at 53A-222, which is very similar in its structure to 223A, but provides in relevant part that, as an example, a person is guilty of violation of conditions of release in the first degree while charged with the commission of a felony, such person is released, and it goes on to say, and intentionally violates, and here's the key words, one or more of the imposed conditions of release. The one or more language in 53A222 indicates that regardless of whether a defendant violates the conditions of release once or more than once, he's only guilty of one count. That language is not present in 53A223A and therefore demonstrates that the legislature did not have a similar intent with respect to protective orders. And as a result, supports a reading of the statute that permits violation of multiple provisions of an order to support multiple convictions under the statute. The court went on to say that if we adopt the defendant's proposed interpretation, a defendant may, for example, contact a victim, later assault her, each in violation of the order, of course, but only be convicted of one count. Such a result would be inconsistent with the legislature's desire to protect victims by increasing the penalty for violating protective orders, suggesting that 53A-223A should be read to permit criminal liability for each discrete act in violation of an order. This obviously stems from the very well-known case involving Tracy Thurman uh, Matuzic, that was Thurman versus the city of Torrington, which is cited in this case, who had been abused by her ex-husband after his release from jail in 1996. So question one has been resolved by the court. The statute does support multiple convictions for discrete acts in violation of its language. So then the next question is, the defendant argues that the violation of the protective order was a continuing offense and that because the conversation at issue at that juvenile hearing lasted only for a short time, it should be viewed as a single violation. The defendant made the analogy to a previous uh, Supreme Court case, State versus Nixon, where the knife assaults in Nixon were held to be a single continuous act. The state argued that the violation of the protective order is more analogous to a sexual assault, which is a separate act crime, than something like a kidnapping, which is a continuous crime. The Supreme Court agreed with the state and concluded that each conviction was supported by a separate act, and because the victim's resistance, effectuated by her silence slash ignoring of the defendant, was an intervening event that caused the defendant to escalate his behavior. The Supreme Court cites State v. Miranda, wherein it said that distinct repetitions of a prohibited act, however closely they may follow each other, may be punished as separate crimes without offending the double jeopardy clause. The test is not whether the criminal intent is one and the same and inspiring the whole transaction, but whether separate acts have been committed with the requisite criminal intent and are made punishable by the statute. The court supports its reasoning by describing what separated the defendant's statements into two criminal acts, and it was the defendant's escalation from when he moved from non-threatening conversation to threatening conversation. His initial statement, the small talk, I love you, uh, why don't you talk to me, while that might have been pleasant in nature, it was still a violation of the order. He was not to make any contact whatsoever. It was a completed offense because he had contacted her. The second set of statements, wherein he said that the victim would have problems when he got home and that he was going to kill her, occurred only after she had not responded to him and his tone changed. Finally, in 
dispatching the defendant's double jeopardy argument, the Supreme Court cited State versus Urbanowski, mentioning that it is not dispositive in a double jeopardy analysis that multiple offenses were committed in a short time span and during a course of conduct that only victimized a single person. Our next case is State of Connecticut versus Lewis M. Rodriguez. The citation for this is SC20372. This is an opinion written by Justice McDonald and released on September 24th, 2020. This case involves the well-established Golding Evans Review Standard, which sets forth that unpreserved claims of constitutional error may be reviewed when they allege the violation of a fundamental right. The issue often depends on whether the asserted error has been deemed by the appellate courts to be of constitutional magnitude. In Golding, the Supreme Court stated that a defendant can prevail on a claim of constitutional error when it's not preserved at trial only if all of the following conditions are met. One, the record is adequate to review the claim. Two, the claim is of constitutional magnitude alleging the violation of a fundamental right. Three, that the alleged constitutional violation clearly exists and clearly deprived the defendant of a fair trial. And four, if subject to harmless error analysis, the state has failed to demonstrate harmlessness of the alleged constitutional violation beyond a reasonable doubt. In the absence of any one of those conditions, the claim must fail. And with that review of the Golding Evans review, let's get to your facts. The defendant in Rodriguez was convicted after a jury trial of two counts of sexual assault in the first degree and one count of criminal attempt to commit sexual assault in the first degree. In the case, the victim was walking from her residence to a nearby convenience store when a car with two male occupants pulled the victim into the back seat of the car. The two men stopped the vehicle at an abandoned housing complex where they sexually assaulted the victim and made her perform oral sex. The victim was examined at the New Britain General Hospital and a sex assault evidence kit was processed. The lab found sperm in the vaginal and genital swabs, but when they searched the DNA found on the swabs, against the DNA contained in the combined DNA index system, also known as CODIS, there were no matching profiles found. Ten years later, in 2016, the defendant became a person of interest in the case, and based on a CODIS match, when his DNA was entered into the system at some point after the assault, the police spoke with the defendant, and he denied having sex in a threesome, but consented to the taking of a buckle swab. A match was reported between the buckle swab and the DNA taken from the victim's sex assault kit, and the defendant admitted to engaging in a threesome on two occasions in hotels. At trial, three lab reports analyzing the DNA sample were introduced into evidence through the testimony of Angela Presch, a forensic science examiner with the state lab. On appeal, the defendant claimed, first, that the trial court violated his right to confrontation, as articulated in Crawford v. Washington, by allowing a laboratory analyst to testify about the results of a DNA identification analysis without requiring testimony from the individual who generated the DNA profiles. Second, the defendant claimed that his due process right was violated by the introduction of DNA identification evidence that was unreliable under Manson v. Brathwaite because of the danger that the jury would not understand the meaning of what's called random match probability. With respect to claim one, the defendant argued that during the questioning, Pretch testified that she did not conduct the underlying testing of the 2016 report. Instead, she used an unnamed analyst's data to deduce the characteristics and sources of the DNA profiles. This, as the defendant claims, is a violation to his right to confrontation to question that individual who generated the profile. The defendant conceded that he did not preserve this claim properly at trial and sought review under the Golding Evans analysis. The state argued that the record was inadequate to establish factually whether a confrontation right violation had occurred. The court agrees with the state. The Supreme Court held that under the first prong of Golding for the record to be adequate for review, the record must contain sufficient facts to establish that a violation of a constitutional magnitude had indeed occurred. Here, the record was inadequate in that it was unclear whether the 2016 retesting of the vaginal swab was performed by someone other than Pretch. Testimony suggested that Pretch performed the test herself. 
In cross-examination, when asked by defense counsel twice whether, quote, you conducted, unquote, additional testing of the vaginal sample in 2016, Pretch responded yes both times. She also, however, testified on cross-examination without reference to a specific test that, quote, I was the analyst who analyzed the data. I did not develop the profiles, nor did I do the lab work, unquote. Because of that inconsistent testimony, it's unclear whether someone other than Presh retested the vaginal samples in 2016, and any conclusion attempted to be drawn as to who retested the samples would be purely speculative. And because there was an inadequate record to establish whether the violation of confrontation did in fact incur, the court concluded that the defendant's claim must fail under the first prong of Golding and declined to review the claim. With respect to the defendant's second claim, the court engages in a bit of background education regarding the principles of DNA evidence. DNA evidence consists of two elements. The first, a determination that the defendant's genetic profile matches a genetic profile present in the evidentiary sample. And then second, a statistical calculation of the rarity of that match. Now, this is because a match means little without the statistical evidence that allows the fact finder to determine the strength of the match, and thus the strength of the inferential fact that the defendant is the person whose DNA is present in the sample. The court outlines three types of statistical methods relevant to the claim in this case that are used to express the rarity of the match. First, you have random match probability. You have the combined probability of inclusion. And then finally, you have source probability. Now, random match probability is the probability that the defendant's DNA profile would match the DNA profile of an unrelated member of the general population who was chosen at random. The combined probability of inclusion is employed when there is a mixed DNA profile, which indicates the presence of genetic material from two or more contributors. And then the source probability is the probability that someone other than the defendant is the source of the DNA found at the crime scene. If you've followed me thus far, the defendant argued that unless the prosecutor probably, properly, not probably, but properly explained the DNA evidence to the jury in a much better fashion than I just did to you, the listener, then the jury would likely believe that a random match probability of 1 in 230,000 is the likelihood that the defendant is not the source of the DNA in the vaginal sample. The defendant noted that the prosecutor in this case only asked Pretch one question about the statistical probability of the match, and on cross-examination, Pretch only briefly discussed her probability statement. The defendant further argued that the jurors likely would have misunderstood Pretch's testimony regarding the combined probability of inclusion as indicating source probability rather than random match probability. So essentially, he's saying the jurors were confused and there was not an appropriate explanation to differentiate these different types of statistical calculations. And because of that, and because you have confusion, the juror probably interpreted interpreted this evidence in the wrong fashion, in a way that was prejudicial to the defendant. In the court's analysis, they assume that the defendant's claim asserts a constitutional violation and not merely an evidentiary issue. Remember, under Golding Evans' case law, Evidentiary issues do not reach constitutional magnitude and are thus not reviewable. But nonetheless, the court concluded that the defendant failed to establish a constitutional violation. There is no indication in the record that the jury misunderstood anything. If the defendant believed that the DNA evidence was unreliable, misleading, or required more detailed expression or explanation, he had the opportunity to object, cross-examine, present his own expert, or request a jury instruction. Now, the defense counsel in this case never sought to elicit any additional information regarding the combined probability of inclusion, nor did he present his own statistical evidence or request any jury instruction. And despite the fact that the defendant did not request a jury instruction addressing the DNA evidence, the trial court nonetheless instructed the jurors that in deciding what the facts are, you must consider all evidence and then further instructed that expert testimony is presented to assist them and no such testimony is binding upon them. The defendant asked the court to exercise its supervisory authority to require trial courts to instruct the jury on the meaning of the random match 
probability when DNA evidence is the only evidence identifying the defendant as the perpetrator. The state replied that this request should be denied because the DNA evidence was not the only evidence of guilt in this case. The court declined to use its supervisory powers, citing State v. Wade, that those powers are invoked only in rare circumstances when traditional protections are inadequate to ensure the fair and just administration of the courts. The third case on this docket is State of Connecticut v. Michael Marsala. This opinion was written by Justice Mullins. The citation is SC20249, and it was released on September 16th, 2020. Here are your facts. The defendant appeals from the judgment of the appellate court affirming his judgment of conviction rendered after a jury trial for criminal trespass in the first degree in violation of Connecticut General Statute 53A-107. The defendant had a reputation for panhandling, he was asking people for money, around the Connecticut Post Mall in Milford, property owned by the Westfield Corporation. Panhandling is prohibited on mall property. During the holiday season, the Westfield Corporation hires Milford police to assist with security. The mall had a ban notice on file from July 2015 against the defendant stating that he was banned from mall property for one year. In November, an officer of the Milford Police Department, while working a private duty job, saw the defendant panhandling on mall property and informed him that he was banned and that the next time he's caught on mall property, he would be arrested for trespassing. The very next day, the defendant was panhandling on mall property again and was arrested and charged with criminal trespass in the first degree. At trial, the party's dispute centered around the element of criminal trespass in the first degree that requires the defendant's unlawful entry to have occurred, quote, after an order to leave or not to enter was personally communicated to the defendant by the owner of the premises or other authorized person. That's the language from the statute. The state offered proof in the form of the police officer's testimony that she told the defendant that he had to leave because he was banned from being on law property and that the next time he's caught, he'd be arrested. The defendant argued that the statute requires the order not to to enter to be communicated by the owner of the premises or an authorized person and that the state failed to prove that the Milford police officer was authorized to communicate that order. The defendant introduced into evidence the mall's lesson plan used to train the security staff to prove that Westfield had not authorized their security staff to ban violators of the panhandling prohibition from mall property for more than one year. And because the police officer was working in a private capacity to assist the staff, The policy in the lesson plan extended to the Milford officer, and so she exceeded her authority under the lesson plan. Now, the lesson plan stated, only those individuals who have committed a crime at the shopping center will be considered for banning, and as in compliance with local, state, and federal ordinances. The director of security, assistant director of security, or security supervisor can only temporarily ban suspects for the remainder of the business day. After the close of evidence, the defendant filed a written request for a jury instruction on the infraction of a simple trespass, which he asserted was a lesser included offense of criminal trespass in the first degree. The state opposed the instruction on the grounds that the second prong of state versus Wisnet was not satisfied because simple trespass requires proof of an element that criminal trespass in the first degree didn't. That proof is that the defendant enter or remain on the premises without intent to harm any property. The trial court agreed with the state's argument and denied that request for an instruction. The appellate court affirmed that decision and concluded that the defendant's requested instruction failed the third and fourth elements of Wisnet because there was no reasonable view of the evidence that permitted the jury consistently to find that the defendant is not guilty of criminal trespass but somehow guilty of simple trespass. On appeal to the Supreme Court, the defendant claims that the appellate court incorrectly determined for the third and fourth prongs of Wisnet that there was no evidence that permitted the jury to consistently find him not guilty of criminal trespass in the first degree, but guilty of simple trespass. The defendant argued that the jury could have agreed with him that the state failed to prove that the mall security guard and the Milford police officer were so authorized to ban him from mall property and thus found him not guilty of criminal trespass in the first degree. 
but regardless, could have still found that the state proved that he had been told multiple times that he was not allowed to enter the property to panhandle. The defendant also argued that the jury could have credited the testimony from the Milford officer that the defendant tried to leave the property when the officer saw him on the day of the incident. He argued that this evidence provided the jury with an independent basis to find for the purposes of simple trespass that the defendant knew he was not licensed or privileged to be on panhandling to be panhandling on mall property. The state argued that under the facts if the jury found that the state proved failed to prove that mall security and the officer were authorized to exclude the defendant it could not have found that the defendant knew he was not permitted on the property, that those two things were not consistent with one another. Now, in considering these arguments, the Supreme Court conducted a review of State versus Wisnet. Now, State versus Wisnet says that a defendant is entitled to an instruction on a lesser included offense if, one, an appropriate instruction is requested by either the state or the defense, two, it is not possible to commit the greater offense in the manner described in the information or bill of particulars without having first committed the lesser offense. Three, there is some evidence introduced by either the state or the defense or by a combination of their proofs which justifies conviction of the lesser offense. And four, the proof on the element or elements which differentiate the lesser offense from the offense charged is sufficiently in dispute to permit the jury consistently to find that the defendant was not guilty of the greater offense, but guilty of the lesser. So the court limited its analysis to the fourth element because it concluded that the defendant's requested instruction failed that element. It cited state versus mainly, which said that proof is sufficiently in dispute when it is of such a factual quality that it would permit the fact finder reasonably defined the defendant guilty of the lesser included offense. The court first identified that the element that differentiates simple trespass from criminal trespass in the first degree is that criminal trespass requires the additional fact that the defendant's unlawful entry occurred after an order to leave is personally communicated to the defendant by an authorized person. And so in light of the evidence introduced at trial, if the jury were to find that the state failed to prove that the officer and security guard were authorized to ban the defendant for longer than the rest of the business day, the jury could not consistently also find that there was a valid ban in place against the defendant when he entered the mall property again. The jury would have been required to find that the original ban notice on file was invalid. The jury could not have found that the bans in general issued by mall security were not authorized beyond the business day, but also find that the ban was on file was valid more than four months later without resulting to some sort of improper speculation as to whether it had been issued or approved by someone with the authority to do so. Our fourth and final criminal law case out of the Supreme Court for the month of September is State of Connecticut versus Lamantia. This is an opinion written by Justice Kahn. Citations SC20190, and it was released on September 3rd, 2020. Here are your facts. The defendant was accused of sending text messages to her boyfriend after he had engaged in a physical altercation with a third party male. Those text messages were witness tampering in the sense that they notified the boyfriend that the police were on their way and instructed the boyfriend to place some blood on his clothing. The defendant further in her text messages directed the boyfriend to tell the police that the third party male frequently stalks the defendant and that the boyfriend followed the defendant to the location where the fight commenced because he loves his girlfriend. The defendant emphasized to the boyfriend that they need to stick to the same story. At trial, the defendant offered testimony that she did not send the text messages to the boyfriend at all and claimed that they did not come from her phone, and even if they did, someone else had sent them. And she also testified that her and the boyfriend were not in a relationship at the time of the altercation. The jury returned a verdict of guilty of tampering with a witness in violation of 53A-151. The defendant appealed, claiming that the evidence was insufficient to support the conviction because the state failed to prove that she sent the text messages with 
the specific intent required. The appellate court affirmed the conviction, concluding that the evidence established that the defendant was aware of the investigation by police of the physical altercation involving the boyfriend and the third-party male, and that the jury could also find that the defendant, knowing that the investigation had commenced and had learned the identity of the participants, including the boyfriend, that she believed that an official proceeding would probably result. So on appeal to the Supreme Court, the defendant claims that the appellate court incorrectly concluded that there was sufficient evidence to permit a jury to reasonably infer that the defendant had a specific intent to interfere with a witness's testimony at an official proceeding. Part of the argument here was that there was no evidence to infer that she thought it was more probable than not that a future criminal trial would occur or that she thought that her boyfriend would even testify at such a trial. The state argued that the evidence was sufficient to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant intended to induce her boyfriend to testify falsely in an official proceeding that she believed to be imminent. Now, the standard of review for insufficiency of the evidence is well known. The court must construe the evidence in the light most favorable to sustaining the verdicts, then determine whether a jury could reasonably have concluded that the evidence established the defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. When a claim for insufficient evidence turns on the appropriate interpretation of the statute, the court's review is plenary. Now, the court reviewed the witness tampering statute here, that's 53A151, which says a person is guilty of tampering with a witness if, believing that an official proceeding is pending or about to be instituted, he or she induces or attempts to induce a witness to testify falsely. Supreme Court pointed to State v. Cavallo, which says that it, this statute, 53A151, applies to any conduct that is intended to prompt a witness to testify falsely or refrain from testifying in an official proceeding. So the state's required to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that, one, the defendant believed an official proceeding was pending or was about to be instituted, at which her boyfriend would likely be a witness, and then, two, that the defendant induced or attempted to induce the boyfriend to testify falsely. Now, State v. Ortiz, a case cited in the Supreme Court's opinion here, held that an official proceeding that was pending or about to be instituted includes not only those proceedings that have been initiated, but those that are probable or readily apt to come into existence or to be contemplated by a defendant. So as long as the defendant believes that an official proceeding will probably occur, well, it doesn't matter whether an official proceeding actually is pending or is just about to be instituted. So in the present case, the jury was given evidence that the defendant had more than mere knowledge of an alleged investigation. Evidence was presented that the defendant knew that there had been a physical altercation involving her boyfriend. She was present when 911 was called. She knew that state troopers were investigating the altercation, and the defendant provided the state troopers with the names of all three people involved in the altercation, even provided her boyfriend's address. And so a jury can reasonably conclude that the defendant had the knowledge and contributed to the investigation, knew of and identified the, identified the witnesses to the incident, including herself, and knew there was physical evidence of the crime as evidenced by the injuries to the third-party male. She also knew that the police were taking the complaint seriously enough to track down witnesses in the middle of the night. So on the basis of this evidence, the jury could reasonably conclude that the defendant believed an investigation would probably progress into an official proceeding. And going back to State versus Ortiz, the court held here that the same evidence introduced by the state to prove that the defendant believed an official proceeding would occur at which the boyfriend would likely be a witness was also sufficient to allow a jury to infer that the defendant induced or attempted to induce the boyfriend to testify falsely. So State versus Ortiz says that a jury may consider a defendant's attempt to prevent an individual from giving a statement to the police as evidence of her intent to influence the testimony of that individual at a future proceeding. So the jury could have reasonably concluded that the defendant had no problem perjuring herself on the witness stand when she denied her relationship with the boyfriend, even after being repeatedly impeached by her own testimony, and from such could have inferred, in light of all the other evidence, that the defendant intended the boyfriend to do the same when the time came. So let's recap. In State versus Cody M., the Supreme Court held that the defendant's 
Two convictions for violation of a standing criminal protective order did not violate the constitutional protection against double jeopardy because the legislature permitted convictions for multiple distinct acts that constitute separate violations of the Connecticut General Statute 53A 223A. And the defendant's statements constituted two distinct acts because the victim's resistance, which was effectuated by her silence, was an intervening event causing the defendant to escalate his behavior. And that escalation separated the statements into discrete acts. The main takeaway from State versus Rodriguez is remember Golding. It mandates that you make a record and sometimes it means more than just placing facts on the record, but making those facts clear, clear enough for the court to actually engage in review. The other takeaway from Luis Rodriguez is that given the forensic examiner properly explained the statistical method she used to determine the rarity of that DNA match, and that the lawyer in this case had the opportunity to cross-examine, present his own evidence, or request a jury instruction, there was a failure on the defendant's part to establish that a due process violation had indeed occurred. In State v. Marsala, it was held that in the case in which the defendant was convicted of criminal trespass in the first degree, the trial court properly denied the defendant's request for an instruction on the lesser included offense of simple trespass because the police officer testified that she approached the defendant while in full police uniform and told him that he had to leave as he was banned from being on wall property and that the next time he was caught on wall property, he would be arrested for trespassing. That communication was undoubtedly in order not to enter mall property, and when the defendant was seen on wall property again, he was arrested. That order constituted a sufficient enough difference between the uh, alleged lesser included requested by the defendant so that the denial of that instruction to be given to the jury was upheld. Finally, in State versus Lamantia, the evidence was sufficient to show that the defendant was guilty of tampering with a witness because the defendant knew that there had been a physical altercation between her boyfriend and a third-party male. She was present when her boyfriend called 911 to report an assault. She was aware that state police had names of all three individuals involved. The jury could reasonably infer that the defendant believed an investigation would probably progress into an official proceeding and that she had intent to either prevent her boyfriend from testifying or encouraged him to change his testimony. So there you have it. That's your review of the Supreme Court's issued opinions in the area of criminal law for the month of September 2020. Thank you once again for listening to the Connecticut Case Law Podcast. I am Dan Lage, civil rights and criminal defense lawyer with Ruane Attorneys at Law. I'll see you next week when we return with our regular format covering the most up-to-date developments in the area of criminal law from the appellate and Supreme Court. You can call or email me anytime to talk through a civil rights case or a criminal law case. I can be reached via phone at 203-925-9200 or by email. That would be daniel at ruaneattorneys.com. If you have any comments or suggestions about this podcast, please call, email. I welcome all your comments. I look forward to talking to you. I look forward to talking with you next week here on the podcast. Or if I see you in the courtroom, chat me up. Till then, see you next time. Next up, injury law cases. If you know someone who has been injured, Connecticut Trial Firm can help. Our lawyers handle car accidents, malpractice, dog bite, and premises liability cases across the state of Connecticut. Our lawyers have achieved multi-million dollar verdicts and settlements. Our trial team has the experience and the resources to make a difference. Connecticut trial firm attorneys are always available to consult with fellow attorneys on injury law issues at any time. Put the power of over 124 five-star reviews to work for your personal injury referrals by trusting the team at Connecticut trial firm. Visit cttrialfirm.com for more information or call us 24-7 at 860-471-8333. Hi, it's Connecticut personal injury attorney Ryan McKean, and I'm so excited for this podcast and to be able to discuss case law with you this week. And we've got a very important case 
that came out in September from the Connecticut Supreme Court in personal injury law. And that case is Dugan versus Sikorsky Aircraft Corporation, and I think has a special relevance uh, to what is going on today with COVID and the legal complexities that are sure to follow. The Supreme Court of Connecticut had the opportunity to address an issue of first impression in Dugan v. Sikorsky Aircraft Corporation, in an action to recover damages for the defendant's alleged negligence in exposing the plaintiff to asbestos, the court granted the defendant's motion for summary judgment in favor of the defendant and vacated the order granting class certification. Now, the central issue in this case was whether to permit medical monitoring in the absence of some present manifestation of physical injury. Medical monitoring either in the form of damages or as a standalone cause of action allows a plaintiff to recover the cost of diagnostic testing for an injury that may occur in the future as a result of the defendant's tortious conduct. At the trial court, the defendants motioned for summary judgment. They argued that the plaintiffs had not suffered actual injuries and instead sought medical monitoring for a risk of future injury, which they claimed is not a cognizable claim under Connecticut law. The trial court determined that no expert had examined or reviewed the medical records of any of the plaintiffs other than Dugan and that all of the plaintiffs admitted that they had not been diagnosed with asbestos-related disease. Thus, the plaintiffs had not presented enough evidence demonstrating a genuine issue of material fact as to physical injury. The trial court then applied the public policy test outlined in Lawrence v. O&G Industries Incorporated and declined to recognize a cause of action for medical monitoring under Connecticut law that would allow recovery for an increased risk of future injury rather than present injury. The plaintiff's appeal required the court to consider the proof necessary for medical monitoring. Ultimately, the Supreme Court affirmed the trial court's decision because the plaintiffs failed to establish a genuine issue of material fact as to certain elements of the claim. In particular, whether the provision of medical monitoring is reasonably necessary for them. On appeal, the plaintiffs argued that the trial court incorrectly determined there was no issue of material fact as to their injuries because they suffer from subclinical injuries as a result of their asbestos exposure. The Supreme Court agreed with the defendants that even if they were to recognize a remedy in Connecticut for medical monitoring in the absence of the present manifestation of physical harm, the plaintiff's claims would still fail as a matter of law because the plaintiffs failed to prove that monitoring was medically necessary. Although state appellate courts have been divided with respect to whether to permit recovery for medical monitoring in the absence of the manifestation of physical injury, the plaintiff asked the court to adopt the legal framework from Donovan v. Philip Morris, USA, a case decided by the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts. The Massachusetts High Court recognized a standalone medical monitoring cause of action for subclinical injuries under Massachusetts law. The Massachusetts court outlined the following standard for its medical monitoring cause of action, requiring that each plaintiff prove that the defendant's negligence caused the plaintiff to become exposed to a hazardous substance that produced at least subcellular changes that substantially increased the risk of serious disease, illness, or injury, for which an effective medical test for reliable early detection exists. And early detection combined with prompt and effective treatment will significantly decrease the risk of death or severity of the disease, illness, or injury. And such diagnostic medical examinations are reasonably and periodically necessary, comfortably within the standard of care, and the present value of the reasonable costs of such tests and care as of the date of the filing of the complaint. 
In addition, the court stated that proof of these elements usually will require competent expert testimony. Now, the Supreme Court in Connecticut concluded that the plaintiffs did not establish the existence of a genuine issue of material fact as to certain Donovan factors. Courts generally require expert testimony to prove a medical monitoring claim remedy. Thus, summary judgment is proper if a plaintiff lacks such expert testimony. Here in Dugan, the expert affidavit submitted by the plaintiffs was ambiguous about whether each plaintiff actually suffered subcellular harm that substantially increased the risk of injury. Further, although this ambiguity alone does not defeat summary judgment, the Supreme Court found that the plaintiff failed to present sufficient evidence as to the fifth and six factors of Donovan. The court reasoned that each plaintiff needed to demonstrate, through expert testimony, reasonable necessity that the administration of the medical test to a specific plaintiff is medically advisable for that plaintiff. In the plaintiff's expert witness deposition, the expert stated that he had not formed an opinion as to the plaintiffs. This admission demonstrated that there was no genuine issue of material fact as to whether medical monitoring is reasonably necessary for the plaintiffs, and the deposition did not provide any explanation as to why the plaintiffs required medical monitoring because of their asbestos exposure. Because the expert in this case provided no opinion as to the plaintiffs, and in the absence of any evidence demonstrating the reasonable necessity of medical monitoring, the court concluded that the plaintiffs did not demonstrate a genuine issue of material fact. Accordingly, the trial court had properly granted summary judgment in favor of the defendants. As you can tell, the Dugan case is going to have significant impacts on Connecticut law for years to come, especially as we understand science even more, as we understand medicine even more, and tests become more precise and possibly more expensive over time. So it's this Dugan versus Sikorsky aircraft corporation provides a real roadmap for the future battles that are going to be fought certainly uh, in medical monitoring cases thank you so much i hope you enjoyed this episode if you have subscribe we look forward to next week next up family law cases if you know someone who needs the advice of a lawyer who focuses exclusively on divorce and other family matters rich rockland is your guy Rich handles cases all across the state of Connecticut, including the state appellate court, and welcomes your referrals. Rich will personally handle the case and will be attentive to all your clients' needs. Family litigation is stressful, and you don't need your referral stress being taken out on you. Rich's goal is to counsel his clients through a family law case with an eye towards resolving the issue in a manner that protects their interests while minimizing their stress and yours. If you would like to discuss a referral of a family law matter, please contact us at 860-357-9158. We have virtual consults available and in-person consults in West Hartford Center and welcome the call from fellow attorneys. Blondo versus Baltiera. During the month of September, the Connecticut Supreme Court decided one case in the area of family law. In the case Blondo v. Baltiera, the parties entered an agreement to engage in arbitration. Soon after, the defendant filed an application to confirm the arbitration award, and the plaintiff filed a motion to vacate the arbitration award. The issue was tried, and the trial court ultimately granted the plaintiff's motion to vacate because the arbitrator had exceeded her authority under the arbitration agreement, the arbitrator displayed a manifest disregard for the law in her decision-making, and the award improperly included issues related to child support. The Supreme Court reversed the judgment that the arbitrator had exceeded her authority and displayed a manifest disregard for the law, but upheld the trial court's determination that the inclusion of issues related to child support in the arbitration award was improper. At the outset, the court noted that the defendant in this case did have the ability to obtain appellate review because Section 52423 expressly confers on the parties the right to appeal from orders related to the judicial enforcement of arbitration awards. Under Section 46B-66C, the right to appeal conferred by Section 52423 is applicable to any agreement to arbitrate in a dissolution action, provided 
Such agreement and an arbitration pursuant to such agreement shall not include issues related to child support, visitation, and custody. The plaintiff attempted to argue that the language pertaining to issues related to children contains a condition precedent which excluded this case. The court rejected the plaintiff's construction of the statute and found that the restriction in section 46b 66 c is not a condition on the party's right to appeal, but rather a limitation on the enforceable scope of the party's arbitration agreement. Thus, a fair and equitable agreement to arbitrate is valid, irrevocable, and enforceable, except to the extent that it includes issues related to child support, visitation, and custody, which can only be resolved by a court. Once the court found that it did have sufficient appellate jurisdiction over the party's claims, the court was required to determine the necessary degree of specificity that a party must provide in a motion to vacate under Section 52420. After applying a statutory analysis, the court found that nothing in the statute requires a movement to articulate the factual basis for a motion to vacate, modify, or correct an arbitration award. All the statute requires is that the motion be filed within 30 days of the date that the arbitration award was received. When reviewing the party's claims, the Supreme Court applied the general rule that judicial review of arbitration awards should be conducted in a manner designed to minimize interference with the ADR system, so deference should be given to the arbitrator's award, acts, and proceedings. The standard of review depends on whether the submission to the arbitrator is restricted, which reserves explicit rights and conditions for de novo review by a court, or unrestricted, which is final, binding, and unreviewable by a court. The court found that the arbitrator's powers in this case were unrestricted, which means that judicial review was confined to determining only whether the arbitrator exceeded her authority under Section 52418. In comparing the award to the submission, the court found no evidence that the arbitrator ignored her obligation to interpret and apply the arbitration agreement. In this case, both parties were asking the arbitrator to determine the reach of the terms of their premarital agreement regarding assets and whether French or Connecticut law applies. The trial court erred in ruling that the arbitrator's award exceeded the scope of the party's agreement because the arbitrator determined that home equity fell within the scope of the premarital agreement, evidenced by the fact that she relied on premarital agreement to determine that the party's home was joint property because it was held in both names. Further, the court found that the arbitrator did not present manifest disregard for the law when she applied Connecticut law to the distribution of equity in the marital home, even though the premarital agreement included a choice of law provision, which the defendant argued designated French law as governing the distribution of joint property. Because the arbitrator's decision to apply Connecticut law was not an egregious or patently irrational misperformance of duty, she did not manifestly disregard the law. Because the parties have voluntarily chosen to arbitrate, the manifest disregard standard of review is extremely differential. Under the deferential standard, the plaintiff did not satisfy, satisfy the manifest disregard standard simply by persuading the court that the arbitrator misinterpreted the choice of law provision in the premarital agreement because the court will not substitute their interpretation of the premarital agreement for that of the arbitrator. To meet the applicable standard, the error must be obvious by reference to explicit and clearly applicable law, and although the plaintiff's preferred interpretation in the ca this case may have been correct, it was not obviously correct based on the explicit requirements of the premarital agreement. The premarital agreement declared that French law governed their matrimonial regime, but left the meaning of this critical term undefined. In light of these ambiguities, any error that may have been made by the arbitrator in distributing the equity in the marital home did not amount to an egregious or patently irrational misperformance of duty that would permit a court to vacate the arbitration award. The Supreme Court next considered whether the prohibition on the inclusion of child support and arbitration awards is capable of being waived by a party to an arbitration. The court noted that the purpose of the statutory prohibition is the safeguard of the rights of the non-party children, not the parties. In light of this purpose, the plaintiff in this case did not and could not waive the statutory prohibition against the arbitration of issues related to child support. Although financial orders are typically interdependent and represent a mosaic, the child support orders in this case are severable and thus reversible because nothing in the arbitrator's award indicated that the child support orders were interdependent with the other financial orders. Do you want to get into social media marketing? Unsure of where to begin? The Firm Flex DIY plan was created for small firm and solo lawyers who want to start social media marketing for their firm but can't commit to the large budgets many agencies charge. In just five minutes a day, with the help of the Firm Flex coaches, you get daily ideas, weekly themes, hashtags, and stock images you can use to post on social media and market your firm. With a private and vibrant Facebook group you can always turn to, the Firm Flex DIY plan gives you the ultimate control over your marketing. By using the Firm Flex DIY program, as well as our weekly coaching and industry leading hacks, you can set your social media up for success, all for around $3 a day. 
Try it today at GetFirmFlex.com slash DIY. Thanks for listening to the Connecticut Case Law Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast so you get alerted every time a new episode is released. And to give us a five-star rating. You can also watch this podcast on our YouTube channel each week if you prefer to watch in the comfort of your office or stream it on ConnecticutCaseLawPodcast.com. The Connecticut Case Law Podcast is sponsored by Ruane Attorneys at Law, the Connecticut Trial Firm, and Rich Rockland Law. Attorney J. Ruane, Connecticut Juris number 415988, is responsible for the content of this advertisement. See you next week.